Well, good morning. That bumper video is to remind us that next week we're rejoining our series on the book of Acts. Uh, We're starting in Acts 13, which is one of my favorite sections of Scripture because it shows the church uh, so in tune with the Holy Spirit, listening and responding to what the Spirit is telling them and directing them. And Pastor John asked me to uh, let you know that there are a couple of special elements in the service next week involving some of uh, a couple of couples that are going out from our church. And so you won't want to miss it, whether it's online or whether you can come and be here in person. We look forward to having you with us. But today we're going to wrap up our three-week series on worship. Pastor uh, Adam and Pastor Amber have helped us learn what it means to prepare for worship, to to fully engage with God in the worship experience itself. And today we're going to talk about what it means to respond to worship. What does it mean to appropriately respond to what God shows us and tells us in our worship series? Uh, We're going to be looking at Romans chapter 12, the first couple of verses. So if you have your Bibles or your tablets or your phones, you can go ahead and uh, put your Bible apps over there to Romans uh, 12. And we'll be looking there in just a couple of moments. But I thought uh, before we get into that, we could get warmed up by thinking of some of the other uh, appropriate responses to situations in life, just to help us thinking about our appropriate response to worship. So uh, I'm going to share or describe a couple of social situations and then ask you what you think uh, the appropriate response might be. And uh, don't worry, it's a multiple choice quiz. You've got a good shot at getting these things right. So the first situation, uh, when is it most appropriate, when is the most appropriate time to RSVP to an invitation? Uh, A, within 24 hours, B, within one week, or C, any time before the response, uh, respond by date? Uh, Yeah, how many for A? Uh, Just a few for A, uh, for B, okay, it seems reasonable, for C, okay, it looks like C is uh, the majority choice here. Pastor John, how did they vote over in the sanctuary? Want to make sure that they're participating over there too. Well, according to etiquette mentor Marilee McKee, the answer is A, within 24 hours. Now, I admit I have not lived up to this standard myself. But listen to the rationale. It seems like responding within 24 hours doesn't give you much time. But that's the whole point of doing it so quickly. Receiving an invitation is an honor. And even if it's an event you would rather not attend. So responding quickly repays the honor. And then she adds this note. Not responding to invitations is a subject that frustrates a lot of people. Maybe you... uh, I've sat around waiting for an RSVP that never came. Okay, so uh, let's do better on the second one. Situation two, when you receive a gift by mail, except for a wedding uh, gift, you should A, call on the day it arrives, B, open it right away so that you can tell the person uh, how much you appreciate that specific gift, or C, wait until the day you open the gift before calling. Okay, so how many think A might be the correct answer? Looks like a lot of people with A. How about B, open it right away? That sounds fun. That's, I would like to do that. C, wait until the day you open the gift before calling. Okay, a few people with that response too. Well, again, according to Merrily, because I don't trust my own instincts on these things, uh, the correct answer is A, call on the day that it arrives. And the reason for that is that people worry about whether they get you receive the gift that they sent. They can track it on an app, but they've seen too many news stories about porch pirates or neighborhood kids who pick up uh, the gift or even a family member who takes it inside, puts it aside, and forgets all about it. So they say uh, it's the reassuring and polite thing to do is to call or text or email to let the senders know that the gift arrived and to thank them for it even if you haven't opened it because you're waiting for Christmas or a wedding shower, whatever the event might be. So there are a lot more uh, things that we could go into. There's a whole 
uh, questionnaire. There's a URL that'll come up here if you want to take more, learn more. But just poking around the internet, it was amazing how many resources there are on appropriately responding to social situations. Or if you're a diplomat, what the proper uh, protocols are for responding in, in certain situations. But surprisingly, that same web search found a lot less on what the appropriate way is to respond to God in worship. Fortunately, scripture is very clear on this subject, so we don't have to worry. So uh, the Apostle Paul spells that out in the book of Romans, chapter 12. As I said, we're going to look at verses 1 to 2. So let me read it uh, for you from Romans, chapter 12, verses 1 to 2. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. I love that, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Now, Romans 12, uh, verse 1, is a reminder that when we come into worship, we're to do so remembering who God is and what God has done for us. That's what Paul means, what he says, in view of God's mercy. We're to offer ourselves. Uh, we don't deserve to be in relationship with God, but God, by his grace and by his mercy, has opened the door for us so that we can be in relationship with him. And so that means uh, Paul used the example of offering ourselves as a living sacrifice to talk about the posture that we come into worship. It's a humble posture, remembering what God has done to make this possible. To present oneself means to offer or to put at one's disposal. So we're offering ourselves or presenting ourselves uh, dedicating ourselves to something or to someone. And in this case, we're offering and dedicating ourselves to the Lord. It means that we say we're understanding that we were created by God and for God. God created us for his purposes. And we want to live out our lives in a way that reflects what God intended for our lives to be. So we surrender ourselves. We offer ourselves as living sacrifices uh, for his use. And by doing that, we are aligning ourselves. We're aligning ourselves uh, with God and with God's purposes for our lives. Now, we see many uh, examples of the power of alignment all throughout life. If you are aligned with your boss at work, your work life is going to go much more smoothly because you're doing what he or she wants you to do. If you're aligned with your teachers, your academic life is going to go so much better because they know what you need to learn. And if you're cooperating in agreement with that, you're just going to have a better experience or a less frustrating experience. Right now, the Olympics are on, and we see what happens when a great athlete aligns themselves with a really good coach and an excellent training program. The results are amazing, what some of those athletes can do. And if you're aligned with the Lord and with the Lord's purposes for your life, you're going to have a better life because God made you and he gifted you uh, for all the things that he intends for you to accomplish in this life. It's just that simple. Now, Paul goes on to say that when we humbly offer ourselves to God in worship, something happens to us. It changes us. It changes the way we think and act. And responding to worship means, first of all, uh, that, it, that it allows God to change my character and secondly, it means that I become, I start to learn how to act when God leads me. So both character and learning to respond or to act when God leads me to do that. Now, so let's look first at what worship does to our character. Now, verse 2 is key to this. It says, do not conform to the pattern of this world, 
but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Now, worship reorients and renews our mind by reminding us who God is, his character, his power, his wisdom, his acts towards us in saving us and redeeming us. But over the course of a week and over the course of a lifetime, our lives are exposed to lies about both God and about ourselves. Lies like, God isn't powerful enough to change you. This situation is impossible, even for God. And sometimes about ourselves, we believe things that we've heard other people say, like, you're not smart enough, or you'll never change. You will always be this way. Why are you so stupid? Those kinds of things, those kinds of messages that we hear, uh, you know, if, if you think about it, 168 hours in a week, we come to worship for an hour, an hour and a half, and then we have all the rest of that time, and the world bombards us with messages. But worship is that opportunity to reset and renew and to let God change our thinking again and to reorient us so that we are again in alignment with what he says is true. Now, as we think about this, as we believe it, as we internalize the truth about God, uh, those truths change our lives and they change us over time. Now, the apostle doesn't tell us how much time it takes to reorient ourselves and align ourselves with the Lord. Rather, he gives us a test that we can apply to ourselves. And the test is about seeing movement along a, what I call a conformed, transformed continuum. So on the one hand, you, are, you see conformed to the world. And to be conformed means that we're becoming more like the values of the world. So if you are becoming more critical about people, more selfish, less concerned about the needs of others, more consumed with accumulating things, then you are becoming conformed. And Galatians 5 verses 19 to 21 has a pretty specific list of things that can tell you whether you are moving in this direction. So Galatians 5, 19 to 21, I encourage you to go home and, and look that up and to say, hey, am I becoming more like this or less like this? Now, to be transformed, on the other hand, means we're becoming more like the character and person of Jesus. It means that who we are on the outside reflects the power of the Holy Spirit transforming us on the inside. Uh, it means that we're becoming more and more like the power of God in our lives. So we uh, often in worship get convicted that we are uh, not like we should be. But, but Scripture also tells us how we can be. And Romans 12 gives us some really good examples. So if you're still in Romans 12, look at verses 9 and following. It gives us some examples of the kinds of character that God is trying to develop in us. If we are more like these things, then we're moving towards the transformed side of this continuum. So it says here, love must be sincere. We're to hate what is evil. We're to cling to what is good. We're to be devoted to one another in love. To honor one another above ourselves. Never to be lacking in zeal, but fervor fervent in our serving the Lord, joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer, sharing with the Lord's people who are in need, or to practice hospitality. If we are doing these kinds of things, then we're moving towards this side of the continuum. None of us is ever in a static place. We're moving one direction or the other. And the key over time is, am I becoming more like Jesus, am I becoming more transformed according to his power? If I'm living my life that way, then I can be confident that I am being transformed. My character is changing as a result of my time with the Lord. Now you might be asking, why don't we always see that kind of change? 
why, why do some people not seem to change? Uh, pastor and author Mark Laberton suggests the problem is that we haven't completely engaged in worship. In his book, The Dangerous Act of Worship, he says, uh, worship is the dangerous act of waking up to God and God's purposes in the world. But something has gone wrong with our worship. It's become a place of safety and complacency in which solitary individuals only express their personal adoration, focusing on God but ignoring our neighbor. I'll just stop right there. If, if we only come to worship for the feeling that it gives us when we're connecting with God, which is fantastic, we want to do that. Uh, but if we stop there and don't say, okay, God, change me. Allow this to affect the way that I see the world, the way I treat people, then we're missing something. Uh, but true biblical worship, he goes on to say, does not merely point us upward. It should turn us outward as well. So when we come and we respond to the beautiful worship songs that we sing, when we're in prayer, when we're convicted by the scripture, that's great. We should, but that's the starting point. Scripture says that we need to take it the next step. Uh, worship isn't just about what happens an hour per week. It has to shape the other 160 hour, 67 hours as well. So it's not just my character that God is interested in. God is also interested in how I act. And responding to worship means I need to learn to act when God leads me. So acting when God leads me is our second point. And often in worship, we can be convicted that we're not aligned with God in some way. Maybe it's how I'm trusting God about a certain situation or about how I'm responding to another uh, person. Uh, Pastor John and I were reflecting this week that in pre-COVID seating, we were a little closer to each other. And there could be times in a particular service when we could see uh, someone nudge the person that they were sitting next to. We called them the holy nudges, where a spouse or a friend would say, hey, you know, you should pay attention to that point, because th I think that applies to you. Now that you're a little farther apart, we don't see that as often. But worship should be a time where we experience a nudge, not necessarily by the person sitting next to us, but a nudge from the Holy Spirit saying, I want you to pay attention to this. Sometimes that means a person pops into our head. Sometimes it means I'm convicted of the way I acted or treated someone. Sometimes it means, you know, I'm called to pray about a certain situation. Uh, that nudge means it lets us know that God wants us to act on something that we have heard. And this can happen on Sunday or it can happen in our own daily worship time. Um, maybe this has happened to you. Uh, it's happened to me. This week, for example, I woke up and I realized I was worried about something that affected and concerned some people that I really care about. And I was reading that morning in Joshua 24. And in Joshua 24, the Lord was reminding the people of Israel that... Um, God had gone ahead of them in the promised land and to deliver that land to them. In fact, he said, you did not do it with your own sword and bow. I gave you a land on which you did not toil and cities you did not build. God went ahead of them and cleared the way so that they could occupy and have a land of their own. So in that moment, when I read those verses, I realized that God was asking me to trust him that he would work in the situation I was worried about. It was an invitation to pray and to ask God to resolve the situation. I realized I didn't even have to tell God how to resolve it. That if God is going ahead of me, God can figure out how best to resolve it. The way that I might say, hey God, could you do this? Could you do that? Might not even begin to approach the wisdom with which God would handle that situation. Now, so I was called at that moment to trust and to pray and to put aside my worry and to say, God, I believe you can do that. That was the nudge that I got that morning, pray and to trust. Maybe you are getting a nudge right now. Is there something the Lord 
wants you to do. Now, the second half of verse 2, uh, Romans 12, tells us uh, that we will be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Those words, test and approve, uh, remind us that we have a responsibility to follow up with what God shows us when he gives us that nudge. It's up to us to put these things into action, and God will show us uh, how, what to do. And when God shows us what to do, we need to act. God will nudge us, and we will respond. When God speaks, we will listen and we will obey. That's what this means, is we want to be able to test and approve what God's will is. How are we going to do it unless we act on it? Unless we actually do what God calls us to do? When God speaks to us in our worship time, it's an invitation to follow and to participate in what God is about to do. So what about you? Has God been putting someone or on your mind or on your heart do you have a sense of what God is asking you to do next? If so, that's your response to worship this morning. It's following up on what God is asking you to do right away. Because when God prompts us, God is letting us know that it's his timing to act. A few weeks ago, uh, one of our members was in one of the services and he heard Pastor John talking about some of the differences between the Jerusalem church and the Antioch church. And as he was listening to that, he was considering a potential job change. He was working for a company. He was thinking about going to work for a Christian company that he admired. He liked the idea that he'd be around Christians in his workspace. But as he heard Pastor John speak, he, he realized that the Spirit was saying something to him. And the Spirit was saying, I need you to stay where you are because for now, that is your mission. That's where I have put you to be my instrument. And so he knew that. And so he stopped the application process. He stayed where he was. Because to him, that was what it meant at that moment to present his body a living sacrifice. That was his response to what God was saying in worship. Now, someone else might have heard that same message and had the different response. Because God shows each of us individually what it is he wants us to do. There are some general things he wants us all to do. We see him in Romans 12. But when it comes to who he wants us to approach, how he wants us to act in a given situation, God is going to be very specific to each of us. And we need to learn how to listen to that nudge that God gives us, that prompting of the Holy Spirit. God has a plan for each of us, invites us to follow that plan. Our privilege and our joy is to respond to him in true and proper worship. Now, at the beginning of this talk, we took a little quiz about appropriate responses to social situations. So I want to give a little quiz right now about what it looks like to respond to worship. So first question, um, if I sense the Lord drawing my attention to something in worship, I should, A, ignore it. B, see if it repeats for three weeks. C, pay close attention. Okay, C is the consensus here. But have any of you ever felt like, I'm going to wait and see if this repeats? I don't want to act too fast. I'm not too sure if God is doing this. Uh, most of us aren't going to ignore it, but we may not act on it right away. But we do have to pay close attention to it. Second question in our quiz. If I sense that God is directing me to do something, I, I should what? A, wait. B, respond right away. Or C, see if someone else responds first. Well, I think we know where to respond right away. But oftentimes I've wanted to wait or I have wanted to see if someone else was responding because I didn't want to be foolish if I was the one that responded first. And what if nobody else responded? Well, we have to learn to trust that when the Spirit is speaking to us, the Spirit's going to tell us it's okay to do it now. 
because we don't know what the Spirit has done to prepare the heart of somebody that we're prompted to talk to. Or we don't know how God is going to work in a given situation. But that's what he's asking us to do, to begin to test and to approve what is his good and perfect will. And the way we do that is by responding. The other thing to think about in this kind of situation is, who do you think is going to prompt you to say something about the Lord to someone else? The Lord or the devil? Who is going to prompt you to be generous and kind? The Lord or the devil? Who's going to prompt you to say a word of encouragement or stick your neck out uh, to care for someone in need? The Lord or the devil? We're learning to listen. We're learning through this whole series on the book of Acts and in worship to listen to the Holy Spirit and to respond to his promptings. And this worship response is just another lesson that God continues to build into Grace Church of Glendora. I think God is preparing Grace Church of Glendora for some next response. There's something he's calling us to do. And we're praying and waiting for God to show us what that is. So as we prepare to meet the Lord in worship, as we declare the name of Jesus and come to worship in expectation that the Lord will meet us, we need to prepare ourselves to respond because God will speak. So let's pray. And then we're going to sing another song. And what might the Lord be asking us to do today? What might the Lord be asking you to do today? Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for your word, which is so clear and so true. Thank you for the leading of your Holy Spirit, who always directs us and guides us in the way that we should go. Lord, we um, pray for courage, for boldness, for sanity, for the peace of mind, Lord, to trust that when you nudge us, that you've got us, that you've gone before us, just like you did for the children of Israel of old. You are there for us now. So Lord, um, help us to move a little bit forward in our ability to hear and respond to what you want us to do. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.